It's Halloween 2023. Time to indulge in tasty treats without guilt or shame. Time to venture into the dark and become the very monsters we fear. Time to kick back and relax to some scary and allegedly true Halloween horror stories to make this year's Halloween the best it can be. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. Today's episode is the Halloween special, featuring almost an hour of scary stories centering around the chilling time of All Hallows' Eve. Enjoy. Keep in mind, I want to narrate your scary stories of the unexplained, so send them to me at darkstories.org. And if you want to hear more of my terrifying narrations, go to eeriecast.com. Now, let's begin. Oh, and do have a fun and safe Halloween. My First Halloween From Akravola I'm not a native speaker of English. This story started in a girlfriend's house when I was 15 years old. Her name is Angela, and she lived in a wealthy suburb of Athens. We both played on the same volleyball team. She wasn't a snob, so I enjoyed hanging out with her. This was the first time I slept over at a friend's house. Unlike in the US, sleepovers were not a thing in Greece, but Angela and her family were American citizens, and they followed their traditions. It was the same way for Halloween. It was October 30th. I was sitting on her couch hiding behind Angela as the two of us watched scary movies. I think she enjoyed teasing me for how scared I would get, even more than she enjoyed the movies themselves most of which she'd seen a number of times before. Two hours before midnight, I heard the front door open, and I jumped up. I thought that we would be alone since her parents were on a trip to Scotland at the time. Hey, Angela, who is that? I said to her, squeezing my palms on her shoulders. My sister, she replied. My parents decided we needed some adult supervision, I guess. She hopped off the couch and went to look, she had to break away from my scared grip to get up. A minute later, she and her big sister, Lucy, walked into the living room. Meeting her sister for the first time was not a pleasant experience. Angela and I, confident young girls, were not big on makeup at the moment. Her 24-year-old sister, though, was painted like a demon, with a white face and eyes and lips painted black. She was taller than us, obese, and dressed in a combination of black clothes that were tight or loose in all the wrong places. To say the least, she looked off-putting. I said hello as pleasantly as possible, but she didn't reply back. She left us and went up to her room, which was okay by me. I wouldn't mind if I didn't see her again for the rest of my stay. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case. Angela and I did some cooking, watching more movies and talking about stuff leading us to stay up a bit late. A quarter past midnight, Lucy came down from her room, holding something big and square. She had a big smile that somehow made her less attractive and even scarier than before. Hey, girl, since it's nearly officially Halloween, do you want to do something really spooky? She asked. I looked over at Angela, a bit worried. Like what? That Ouija board again? You've never been able to summon anything with that, said Angela. I've summoned things that you don't even know about. You're just so negative they never show up when you're around, she said, looking at me. She went on. But I have a good feeling they'll show up for our friend here. What will show up? I asked Angela. Ghosts, Angela replied. Nonsense. My sister is just fooling herself. Well, what do you think? Lucy asked me. I don't know. I haven't thought about ghosts or death much at all. I said. Then Angela stepped in. Let's get it over with, or she won't leave us alone about all her nonsense. I trusted Angela, and to be honest, I was curious about the whole ghost conjuring thing, so I followed Angela and Lucy upstairs. We went to the attic, then we climbed a second retractable ladder to an even smaller attic. Are you for real? We're gonna freeze up here, Angela protested, 
as we cramped ourselves inside the small space next to an open window, which let in cold air from the dark park across the street. I did research. The tallest place in the house, contact with nature, at the right time, all that together and the magic happens. Lucy explained as she opened up the wooden Ouija board before us. Have you had this thing for a long time? I asked, seeing that the board looked used and dated. It belonged to a powerful occultist, Lucy answered with a self-indulging grin. But from Angela's grimacing, I could tell that she thought it was all BS. The night's cold was beginning to drill into mine and my friend's bones, while her sister didn't seem to be affected at all. We told her to get on with it, so we could head back down sooner. Angela asked me to put my finger on the planchette, as she did. There's no need for that. It will move by itself. We're just going to join hands in a circle, Lucy said. Reluctantly, I took her hand, but comforted myself by holding Angela and looking at her as she was completely calm with her eyes closed. In the dim light that came from the open window, I realized I was the only person looking right at the board. Angela looked to be basically meditating, and Lucy had thrown her head back and was whispering something. Whatever it was, it wasn't in Greek or English. It was a long sentence repeating over and over again, that I could tell. I looked at the board, and I thought that the metal piece had moved, but I couldn't be sure, because I hadn't exactly memorized where it was before. Then Lucy's voice became loud and guttural, still repeating the same sentence. A cold sweat came over my body. Angela tensed up, and she squeezed my hand. I wanted to say something to her, but I was terrified. When I looked at Lucy, my heart began to pound. It looked like the thickness of her neck had almost doubled, and her eyes had no pupils. I wondered if I was seeing things. I squeezed my eyes shut, then opened them, but no, those were her eyes, wide open. Then a loud crashing sound flooded the room. It was like a piano had been dropped from the top of a building, crashing into a million pieces as I was standing right next to where it landed. Something cold then hit me on my neck and it stung. I reached back to check. It was the planchette from the Ouija board, pushing with its edge against my neck. I pulled it and threw it away, and I let out a terrified yell. My scream was enough to wake my friend from her trance. Upon seeing how scared I was, she helped me back down the small attic. She asked what had happened, and when I told her, she looked at me in disbelief. Did you not hear that crash? My ears are still ringing, I explained. She swore that she hadn't heard a thing. This scared me even more. Angela took me down to the living room, making me hot chocolate while I sat on the couch. I was seriously freaked out, thinking about leaving, but because it was so late, I decided to immediately just go to sleep. First thing in the morning, I thought, I would call a taxi. They'd prepared their guest room for me. After a hot shower, I'd calmed down enough, and I started to feel stupid, thinking that I probably scared myself to death, although I did find a red mark where I found that planchette on my neck. Later on, I met with Angela in the living room. She asked me if I wanted to sleep with her in her parents' bed, in case I was scared. Angela was very sweet. I could tell that she felt bad for the whole incident. So I pulled a brave face and told her I was okay and that I had just worked myself into a fit. So, uh, has your sister gone to bed? I asked. I don't know. I haven't seen her since we got back down. Suddenly looking worried, she got up from the couch and ran up the stairs, calling her sister's name. I followed closely on her heels. We reached the attic below the smaller attic where the Ouija board session had occurred. The retractable ladder was still down, leading to the black square opening. We looked at each other, then Angela called Lucy again. We heard noises and slowly Lucy's face appeared in the opening, looking at us with this blank stare. 
We had to call her several times before she came back down. I moved in close to help her, then a god-awful stench pushed me back. The smell was just like the smell of that rotten dead cat the two of us had once found on the roof of my parents' place. It was inhumanly bad. Angela's sister smelled of pure death. I could tell this time Angela had the same experience as me. The two of us covered our noses, but it wasn't enough. We gagged from the wretched smell. We led the dazed and confused Lucy down the stairs, asking each other why every item of her clothes were dripping wet as if she'd been swimming. By the time we got her to her room, she'd regained some composure and her spirit, and the filthy odor had diminished. I'm okay, girls. No need to worry about me. Hope I didn't scare you. I'd sure love to do this again sometime, she said, lying back with a smile of ecstasy. Angela looked at me and her eyes spoke that she was terrified. I pulled the covers over her sister's body and we left her in the room. As I closed the door, I thought about locking Lucy in. Instead, I took my friend by the hand. We went to the guest room where I had all my stuff. We carried them into her room and we locked ourselves in, agreeing that this was the safest way to spend the night. We barely got any sleep until close to daylight. The next morning, Lucy seemed much more like herself. Well, based on Angela's experience, that is. I was to spend two more nights at their home, but I decided I would head back to my parents early. Lucy understood, and we all remained friends. We've gone on some vacations together, but I'll never agree to be anywhere near her sister, although Angela insists that she's now normal. Why I Hate Halloween From Silver Bullet 54 I used to eagerly await Halloween every year when I was growing up. Since I wasn't able to attend Oktoberfest until I was 21, I really didn't have anything else to look forward to. I would trick-or-treat with my sister until she passed, or with friends. Once I went by myself, and I really wish I hadn't. It was 2014. I was bored, so I figured I would buck tradition and go trick-or-treating by myself. I went to a spirit Halloween store and bought a Link costume, since The Legend of Zelda is one of my favorite video game franchises. I saw a few other people there, and figured they were bored or going to a party. So I paid for my things and left. I decided to leave at 5, and when I walked outside, I saw a few other people starting early. I quickly called a couple of friends. One of them had apparently dressed as Laughing Jack, and the other was Clockwork, from Creepypasta Stories. We were talking via FaceTime, and at one point one of my friends asked, Who did you convince to dress as a demon? When I asked what he meant, he replied, Don't play dumb. There's someone standing next to you dressed like a demon. I looked over to my left, but I didn't see anything. I almost looked to my right, but before I turned that way, I felt a chill on the back of my neck. I knew if I turned my head completely, I would see something that I didn't want to see. I decided to just do my trick-or-treating to get my mind off of things. A few people I knew said it was great that I was doing it one last time, but I wasn't able to smile about it, because the whole night I felt a nauseating feeling, and it felt like someone was following me. That same dreadful sensation that if I turned my head, I would see something terrifying followed me. After a couple of hours, I had a giant amount of junk food, so I was ready to go back home. I took a deep breath and turned around. That was a mistake. What I saw wasn't scary at first. It looked like perhaps an eight-year-old kid, and we just stared at each other. He looked at an old house that I just peeked inside to see if there were any occupants. Then he turned back to me, and he said something, with a voice that sounded more animalistic than human. I never went to your house, so don't go to mine. I was about to say something. Then the boy blinked, and when I saw his eyes again, they were red. 
At that very same moment, a scent hit me. It smelled of sulfur. I was so scared, I actually froze there on the spot. Do you want me in your house? He or it then demanded to know. It must have been loud, because a few kids turned towards me then. They screamed and ran away. I quickly shook my head, and this weird kid growled, then vanished. I probably broke Usain Bolt's record, judging by how fast I ran back home. I jumped inside my house and slammed the door shut. I know it was a demon. And I also knew that after that, I was done trick-or-treating for good. Nowadays, it's only Oktoberfest for me. The Last Halloween From David R. Halloween has never been the same for me since that fateful night, back in 1983. It's been about 40 years now, but I still get chills when I think back to the last time I ever went trick-or-treating on Halloween night as a kid. I grew up in a suburban neighborhood, right outside of Chicago. It was a pretty typical middle-class area. Rows of brick houses and ranch styles, big trees lining the streets. Other than the occasional storm, things were peaceful and uneventful. But that all changed when I was 14 years old. It was October 31st, and as usual, I was looking forward to trick-or-treating with my friends, Mike and Eddie. We had our costumes all picked out. I was going as Jason from Friday the 13th. Mike was a typical vampire, and Eddie was dressed up like David Bowie. My friends came over around 6, just as it was getting dark. We gathered up our pillowcases and headed out to start making our way through the neighborhood. Things started normally enough. We hit up all the familiar houses, getting the usual candy offerings. Mini Snickers, packets of Smarties, Tootsie Rolls, and whatnot. After about an hour of walking up and down the streets, our bags were getting pretty heavy with candy loot. We were planning to hit a few more houses on our block and then call it a night. We came up on this one old Victorian-style house on the corner that was always decorated really nice for Halloween. It had fake tombstones and cobwebs all over the yard. But when we walked up the path, there were no lights on. No one answered the door, even after repeated rings of the doorbell and knocks. Disappointed, we turned to leave, but that's when Mike stopped us. He said he'd heard at school a rumor about an old man who lived here. Apparently, decades ago, the man's young son had gone missing on Halloween night, never to be seen again. According to legend, the grieving father refused to celebrate the holiday ever again following the disappearance. Now, maybe Mike was just trying to mess with Eddie and me with a creepy story, but there was something so unsettling about that dark, empty house looming over us. I felt compelled to prove him wrong. I figured the old man had probably just stepped out, and we got there too late. Without thinking, I said we should check the backyard real quick. My two friends hesitated, but eventually followed behind as I made my way along the fence toward the back gate. The gate creaked open easily, and we stepped onto the stretch of overgrown grass behind the house. I headed straight for the back door, hoping to see a light on somewhere inside. But... The whole house was pitch black. As we stood there on the back step, considering our options, a piercing scream shattered the silence. It was high-pitched and agonizing. We whirled around, trying to locate this sound. For a moment, nothing seemed amiss in the dark backyard, but then I spotted something emerging from a far corner, dragging itself across the ground. It looked like a person crawling on their arms, body arched and writhing unnaturally as it moved towards us. The thing let out another wailing shriek, and I could see the flash of a pale, emaciated face turned our way. The three of us screamed in unison, losing any composure we had left. We turned and ran frantically back through the gate, stumbling over ourselves to get away from that yard. We didn't stop sprinting, until we were a block away, breathless and shaking. 
Once we'd all calmed down a bit, Eddie and Mike seemed convinced that someone was just playing a twisted Halloween prank on us. But I knew deep down that what I saw dragging itself across the grass wasn't a person in makeup or costume. The pale flesh, cries of anguish, it was all too real to be staged. I had no proof of what we witnessed, and my friends quickly normalized it as just a prankster trying to get some scares on Halloween. But I couldn't get the image out of my head. I had no doubt what we'd seen in that backyard was something unnatural, something that didn't belong in this world. We decided to call it a night, then we headed home with our candy bags in hand. I hardly slept that night, listening intently for any strange sounds outside my window. When I finally did drift off, I had terrible nightmares of emaciated ghosts trying to scratch their way into my bedroom. The next day, I told my parents what I'd seen behind the house the previous night. They wrote it off, assuming Mike and Eddie had planned the whole thing to frighten me. But I could tell by the looks on their faces that they were unnerved, too. We didn't end up putting up any Halloween decorations that year. I've never gone trick-or-treating again after what happened that night. The following Halloween, I decided to stay home and hand out candy to the other neighborhood kids. As I sat watching horror movies in the living room, I couldn't ignore the feeling that something was watching our house from outside in the dark. To this day, I avoid being out on Halloween night. Even now in my 50s, I find excuses to be traveling for work or visiting family rather than staying local. Because I know that even 30 years later, the sinister presence I felt crawling towards us in that backyard is still lingering out there somewhere whenever October 31st arrives each year. I won't make the mistake again of venturing out after dark in case I might encounter it. Halloween Story from Master P This happened last year on Halloween. I was 18 at the time, and my best friend Andrew was 17. We both thought at the time we were too old for trick-or-treating, and we thought handing out candy was lame. I then came to an idea. There was this old abandoned house that was close to mine. I wanted to go look around inside the house, because I thought it would be a good idea for Halloween. Andrew didn't like the idea, but being an idiot, I told him to stop being a baby. We then waited until it was time, then we headed over to the house. We were carrying flashlights with us so we could see. When we got to the abandoned house, I noticed all the kids trick-or-treating and I felt like gagging. Look, somehow, some part of me always hated Halloween, and I never really knew why. I didn't know why, personally. Maybe it was just because I thought Halloween sucked. But at the moment, this abandoned house thing was making me excited. Anyway, when we got there, I smiled and looked up at it. It was very clearly abandoned. It was a huge mess, and a few windows had boards over them. Andrew then mentioned that we should just go home, because he didn't want to spend the night in jail. I told him once again to stop being a baby. Then, without another word, I headed up to the front door. Once I was close enough, I reached for the doorknob. I was half expecting the door to be locked, but the door actually opened up. Andrew and I then looked at each other. I was worried. Andrew told me we couldn't back down now, so he walked on into the house, and I followed behind him. We were then standing in the front hallway. The house had two floors. We turned our flashlights on, they were quite bright, and they covered most of the area. Andrew told me he was going to look upstairs, and he told me to stay downstairs. Without another word, he headed up. I sighed deeply before heading off myself, then I walked into an empty room. All the furniture there was gone. There wasn't anything in the room, and for some reason I was hoping to see something creepy or at least a bug or a bat. Suddenly, I thought I heard a loud noise behind me. I turned around, aiming my flashlight at the noise, but whatever had made the noise was apparently gone. I walked out of the room into the hallway, still wondering what might have made that noise. Maybe I just imagined it. 
Maybe it was the house settling. I started mumbling about how stupid this was. I decided it was time to go, so I had to find Andrew, then we could leave. I noticed the room in front of me then and realized it was probably the kitchen, so I decided to go check it out. I headed over and I poked my head into the room. I moved my flashlight around. I didn't see anything but the normal kitchen stuff. I then walked into it, wondering if there was anything else in there, besides dust and cobwebs. Just then, I stepped on something that almost caused my foot to shoot out from under me. I moved back and looked down using my flashlight. It was a big kitchen knife. I was about to bend down and pick it up to look at it, but something told me I probably shouldn't touch it, so I didn't. I kept wondering why a knife was inside this abandoned house, but I didn't question it. At worst, I figured when they moved out, the previous owners dropped the knife. I headed out of the kitchen and back to the hallway. That was when I heard a loud scream. It was Andrew. I ran upstairs, continuing to hear him yelling about something. He sounded terrified. When I got to where the screaming was, it was a dark, empty bedroom. I used my flashlight and I soon found Andrew. He was sitting in the back corner of the room, but then I noticed someone else was in the room with us. For one reason or another, the other person did not notice me, or at least they didn't react to me, and I saw Andrew holding his flashlight like a teddy bear. I cleared my throat. Finally, the other person turned around. Whoever this was was taller than both me and Andrew. I couldn't tell if it was a male or female, because they had some kind of creepy Halloween mask on, but they didn't seem to be armed. Leave him alone, I shouted at the person, which was probably a bad idea, because the person laughed, and I could feel anger bubbling up inside of me. I knew that what I was about to do was a stupid idea, but it was the only thing I could think of. I threw my flashlight as hard as I could at this person. It hit them in the face, which made them shout out. This gave Andrew enough time to get away. The two of us ran downstairs, and I could hear the person yelling at us. We didn't look back. We just ran out of the house and down the street before stopping. We were at the sidewalk then, bent over and panting. I groaned under my breath. Andrew pulled out his phone, saying that he was going to call the police about what happened. A moment later... Andrew looked annoyed. He told me the police thought it was a joke, or unimportant, and they hung up on him. I was annoyed because we both knew this wasn't a trick or a prank. We went back to the safety of my house. I wondered then if that person may have been using the old abandoned house as a hideout or their own living space, and if the person was a thief, or worse, like a murderer, perhaps that was their base of operations. After this event, Andrew and I decided we weren't going to do anything crazy for Halloween. We instead helped my parents hand out candy. The time I worked in a haunted Halloween orchard. From Alice May 18. I'm a 26-year-old female. This happened about a decade ago. I still remember it like it was yesterday. A little information first. When I was 13, I was 5 foot 10 and was often mistaken for at least 16 years old. At the time, I lived with my uncle, Jared, along with his wife, two daughters, and my grandma. Jared started his own business as a pool and spa man, including repairs and cleaning, and lifting heavy chemicals and other supplies for his business. He's very good at his job. He's one of those guys people generally like and get along with. We live in Southern California in a nice area, and many rich people live here because the weather is usually sunny and rarely gets more than about 80 degrees Fahrenheit all year long, despite changing seasons. Naturally, he has quite a few customers that are pretty wealthy. One of these customers was a middle-aged woman. She invited my uncle to attend a huge Halloween party that she was hosting at her place. She said that he and his family were welcomed as guests. You see, my uncle was and still is to this day a huge fan of Halloween, as well as a fan of scaring people. That was something we've always had in common. 
So when he heard she was going to have a haunted maze in her avocado orchard, he took her up on her offer and invited me as well. Though I'm not big into parties, I didn't hesitate to say yes, since I would be working the haunted orchard with him. The party was fun and they had good catered food, but I mostly stuck to my family members, trying my best to enjoy the party. But I was much more excited about working the maze. About an hour before the maze opened up, my uncle and I went to go and get ready in our costumes. He went off to one of the vacant parts of her huge house, while I went to get ready in the guest house. My job was to be more of a distraction for the people to pass by in the maze. I was dressed in a shorter Victorian era dress, with fake stage blood covering my body and clothes. Overall, I looked as if I'd been hung by a noose from one of the orchard trees. The plan was to have small groups going into the maze, one group at a time, and I was to be still, drawing people's sights away from Jared, who dressed as Michael Myers with an actual chainsaw, which didn't really match his character. He was right across the path from me, hidden in the shadows. He would then wrap up the chainsaw, and people would run screaming while he chased them down the path. Half an hour into the job, and everything went without a hitch. But that didn't last. I heard some loud talking down the dark path, so I got back into character, amused by people's drunken screams. I could hear about five different voices then. They all sounded like men. Their words were slurred, so I assumed they'd been drinking. The hostess had served alcohol at the party, so I didn't think twice on it. A lot of people drank before going into the maze. I had an uneasy feeling growing in my gut, but I completely ignored it. After all, I was a naive 13-year-old girl who thought she would be safe at a private party. I remember thinking that my uncle had been nearby, so I wasn't all too worried. Well, looky there, one of them said. I heard someone laugh and make catcalls. She's a cutie. I remember my breath freezing in my chest, and my uneasiness returned. I was the only person visible, so I knew that they had to be talking to me. I tried to look out into the dark, but I couldn't see anyone due to a spotlight that was shining on me from my feet. It wasn't until they were about 15 feet away that I finally see the outlines of these men. Wow, she is, another man said as they walked closer to me. I was past the point of unease and just plain scared, so much so that I completely froze in fear. Though taller than most, I was still just a kid, and all five of these men were about my height or taller. There was no way to fight off or run from them. The men approached me, and I remember they completely reeked of booze. Only one or two of the guys' faces were half illuminated by the spotlight. The others' faces were at an angle where they were completely black from the shadow, and I remember cursing the spotlight for shining directly in my face. Hey there, baby. One of them said, getting closer to me. He was literally only inches from me as he and another guy reached out their hands to touch me. How about we leave this place and go have some fun instead? Get away from me, I remember saying, finally finding my voice. Ah, oh, baby, don't be like that, he dragged out. By this point, his other friends were surrounding me to where I was blocked off completely. I looked past them to my uncle's area but I didn't see him anywhere. He must have chased that last group further down the path. I was completely alone. The man had reached toward my chest, but I slapped his hand away as hard as I could. I said, get away from me. My heart beat so loud and fast in my ears. I turned and tried pushing past them so I could run down the path and find Jared, but they used their bodies to make a wall and keep me from leaving. What's the matter? Are we not good enough for you? One of them said, taking hold of my arm. I pulled it against his grasp to try and run, and I mentally prepared for the worst. I remember taking in a deep breath to scream, hoping that someone would take it as an actual sign I was in trouble, not just another person who was being chased in the labyrinth. Then suddenly, I heard the beginning rev of a chainsaw, and all the men looked off in the darkness where my uncle's figure as Michael Myers appeared in the reflecting glow from my spotlight. 
I had never been so grateful to see a serial killer icon in my life. What are you doing to my niece? He demanded, rapidly stepping closer to them. I remember being so relieved to the point of almost crying, but I stopped myself. From the look on these men's faces, this six foot four man, who was strongly built, did the job he worked six to seven days a week, dressed in an orange prison jumpsuit, a Michael Myers mask, and a very real chainsaw on his hands, translated to someone who could easily mess them up for messing with his niece. They started to back away from me, but one guy smiled nervously and said, Hey man, it's cool, we're just leaving. Then he turned to me, and he said with this eerie, disturbing smile, We'll see you later, babe. His hand brushed lightly over my stomach. I froze again, chills running up and down my spine. The man then ran off down the path, my uncle cussing at them and threatening to call the cops as they scurried off even faster. He would have run after them, probably would have done something drastic too, if I hadn't run over into his arms and began to cry. I was shaking violently as the adrenaline wore off. He hugged me, then pulled out his cell phone to call my grandma. She soon arrived, and all three of us went to go and find the hostess to tell her what happened. Sadly, I don't think she was able to do anything, due to me only being able to give vague descriptions of the men, as they were mostly in shadow. And if she did, and I certainly didn't hear anything about it. Even to this day, I can't help but think what could have happened to me that night if Jared hadn't shown up when he did. There's been a couple of times where the lady has thrown more Halloween parties. I still go and work for the haunted maze, but I'm never in direct view anymore. I will actively partake in scaring the people. I've yet to be harassed like that ever again while working there, especially since I found out my true scare tactic, crawling like a fast-moving grudge towards people. I have three pieces of advice to anyone who works in a haunted attraction of sorts. One, just because you work there doesn't mean people won't start trouble with you, even during a private event. Two, always be close to another worker, just in case something happens. And three, always be aware of your surroundings. Just because you're the one doing the scaring doesn't mean you won't be the one to have experienced traumatic events by the end of the night. The Treehouse from Dark Rider 88. Halloween was always my favorite holiday growing up. Dressing up, eating candy, pulling pranks. What's not to love? But ever since that one Halloween night when I was 12 years old, I've never looked at October 31st the same way again. I grew up in a quiet suburb of Denver full of families and kids my age. My parents had moved there when I was young because it seemed like such a safe, friendly neighborhood and it was, for the most part. But maybe nowhere is totally safe from the darker side of things. Anyway, Halloween was a big deal in our community. Everyone would decorate their houses, and kids would spend weeks picking out costumes and planning trick-or-treat routes to hit the best candy spots. My friends and I loved sorting through our halls after a long night knocking on doors. I had two best friends who lived on my block, Josh and Tyler. One year when we were 12, on Halloween afternoon, we hung out in the treehouse in my backyard, planning out our costumes and strategies for that night. We were going to go as the Ghostbusters crew, complete with homemade proton packs my dad helped us build. We could barely contain our excitement as we helped each other with our costumes before heading out around dusk. It was the perfect night, just chilly enough to warrant a jacket, clear skies, and a bright moon. Josh, Tyler, and I set out with our parents trailing behind to supervise. We made our way up and down the neighborhood streets, ringing doorbells and yelling the usual trick or treat at each house. Things were going great. Our bags were loaded up with candy in no time. After a couple hours, we were ready to call it quits. Josh and Tyler came back to my house so we could go through our halls together. We dumped out all the goods on the floor of the treehouse and started sorting it into piles chocolate, fruity candy, and salty snacks. We were deep in trading negotiations when Tyler said he had to pee. The restrooms were all the way inside, so he said he'd just duck behind a tree at the back of the yard. Josh and I went back to swapping candy as we waited. A couple minutes passed, 
and Tyler still wasn't back. Josh and I joked that maybe he fell in, but when it had been over five minutes, we started to get worried. The tree Tyler went behind was only like 20 feet from the treehouse. There's no way using the bathroom would take this long. Josh and I climbed down from the treehouse and slowly walked toward where we last saw Tyler head. As we made our way across the lawn, the wind picked up, scattering leaves at our feet. The moon above was obscured by clouds passing in front of it. We were halfway to the tree when a blood-curdling scream pierced the night. It sounded like Tyler, but twisted and raw in a way I'd never heard before. Josh and I froze, staring wide-eyed at each other. Then we heard it again, that awful guttural scream coming from the dark shape of the tree. We ran inside, yelling for our parents. My dad and Josh's mom came sprinting out. We were crying, trying to explain what we heard. The adults searched the backyard with flashlights, but found nothing. No sign of Tyler or whatever made that horrifying sound. Josh's mom ran to Tyler's house, while my dad called 911. The police showed up, but also found no trace of him. Needless to say, trick or treating was over for the night. Josh's mom stayed with us as we all anxiously awaited news. Around midnight, a knock finally came at the door. It was Tyler, escorted by a police officer. He looked completely normal, not scared or hurt at all. When we asked what happened, he seemed confused. Tyler said he just went to pee behind the tree and came right back, but we weren't in the treehouse anymore. He assumed we went inside without him. Of course we were incredulous. There's no way Tyler could have made it back to the treehouse without us seeing him in that tiny backyard. And we definitely heard those screams that sounded just like him. Tyler insisted he never screamed and that he just took a quick pee break. Our parents were disturbed and relieved at the same time. We were all sufficiently freaked out, so Tyler just went home after that. I slept with the covers over my head that night, listening for any screams from outside my window, but none came. The next day, things felt relatively back to normal. We still had fun trading candy and telling ghost stories like any other post-Halloween, but there was an unspoken unease whenever we made eye contact. Each of us knew what we heard and that it didn't come from our friend. Tyler moved away the next year, and Josh and I drifted apart in high school. But we've never spoken about that night again. I haven't been trick-or-treating since, even now in my twenties. I get anxious as soon as the sun starts going down on Halloween. These days, shadows seem to move in a way they shouldn't, carrying whispers of the unexplained. Whatever terrifying presence visited my backyard that night... I don't intend to encounter it ever again. The Clown From Saris, Victoria This story took place back in 2016, during the clown craze that was going on. My local church has a Halloween-themed carnival every year, and my friends and I decided it would be fun to help out with setting up the carnival and helping run the games. I met up with my friends A and C after school the day of the festivities, because where it was being held was within walking distance of our high school. On our way there, we noticed a man in a clown costume standing right near one of the houses, which was next to the high school. I was already nervous of clowns to begin with, so when I saw him, I instantly became paranoid, but I brushed it off. It was Halloween after all and it was probably just someone dressed up for trick-or-treating, even though it was a bit early, at 3 p.m. We continued walking on down to the clearing where the carnival was being held. We helped things get set up and got into our costumes. Before long, we were having a great time. At about 7 p.m., there weren't that many people left showing up, so we took off walking around the downtown area more specifically one of the nearby streets. They go all out for Halloween here, and A really wanted to see the decorations. C and I agreed, so off we went. There were skeletons and headstone decorations and tall inflatables as far as the eye could see. We were mesmerized by it all, 
It took us a minute to notice the same clown guy from earlier standing near one of the headstones. His costume had fiery orange hair, and the makeup on the mask was funny, as if he just painted over the makeup that was already on it. His clothing was black and white striped, with a huge black and white polka dot neck collar. I was creeped out at that point, but A and C thought it would be marvelous to taunt him and make fun of his costume. I was like, guys, you shouldn't do that. Let's just go. After throwing a few more insults, they gave in to my pleas. We turned and walked back in the direction we came from, away from that clown. Now, there's a store at the end of the street, and a little further down is a donut shop. But in between the two was a long path that went right through a wooded area that had little to no lighting at all and was very creepy at night. C spoke up, saying, Why don't we walk this way? There's no cars, so we'd be less likely to get run over. As if that would happen, A said. We started walking carefully down the path, beginning to talk about the typical stuff teenage girls talk about. Boys we liked, people we couldn't stand, so on and so forth. We heard footsteps fast approaching behind us. We turned around. There was the same clown we'd already seen twice that night. But instead of just standing still and staring at us, he was now running at a full sprint towards us. He was waving what looked to be a butcher knife above his head, like some sort of maniac. We took off as fast as we could, running toward where the carnival was being held. He was catching up quick though, when, by the grace of God, he must have tripped over a fallen branch. Because when we turned around, he was slowly getting back up off the ground. We did not waste the opportunity. We took off, finally making it back to the carnival. When we got there, we explained to our pastor what happened. He ended up calling the police. Eventually, an officer showed up, taking our statements and searching the nearby area. He found nothing, save for the knife the clown had laid in the dirt where he'd fallen. Our pastor took us home, as we were too scared to be out anymore. This may not be the scariest story, but it's definitely one that has stuck with me for years. I'm 22 now, and to this day, I'm absolutely terrified of clowns. Tall Dark Stranger from JGirl44. I live in a modest city in Texas. I was around 17 years old then, so this must have been about 27 years ago. I had decided to go with some girlfriends of mine to a carnival to celebrate Halloween. There's nothing great here in this town, but thankfully we live just 20 miles from Houston. We were hoping to have a good time, as this Halloween landed on a Friday so we didn't have to worry about school the next day. We soon found the perfect spot. Rides, haunted houses, house of mirrors, everything else a group of teenage girls could hope for. One of my friends, Donna, spotted this guy who she thought was cute. She brought him to our attention, saying, Hey, you remember that cute guy I was telling you about? We all remembered her mentioning something, but she thinks just about every guy around our age was cute. When she pointed this guy out, however, he looked older, old enough that I wasn't comfortable with it. We had baseline rules when we went out. One of them was no guys that were out of high school already. This guy was clearly a break in that rule. He had a full goatee with a white streak down the side of his long ponytail. He didn't look old or feeble, just a well bit older than us by at least a decade. The creepy thing about him was, as we were looking at him, he smiled and turned a side glance towards us, as if he knew we were looking. This didn't sit well with Tanya, the oldest of us. She was Sheena's older sister that we had to take with us. We didn't have anything against her except she was the voice of reason, and to us at the time that made her a killjoy, but it was a good thing. She was over 18 and had credit cards. She could rent rooms and other accommodations and all that. That night, she rubbed off on us, and she pointed out more than once that this man had been following us. 
She began to explain, and we all could remember then, we had seen him at various locations throughout the night. We even noticed he was outside of the restroom when we came out. Yeah, sticking together was another one of those rules we found necessary. Sheena had an idea about turning the table on him, so to speak. She thought we should give him a taste of his own medicine and follow him everywhere. A way to let him know that we knew what he was doing to get him to go away. We all agreed it could even be fun, and we could laugh about it later. We started to look at him and follow him. It didn't take long for us to realize that he knew what we were doing. He even at one point got into a line that split into two, so we had to divide up. Two on one side of him and two on the other. After about 15 more minutes of this game, he started walking down a sidewalk, which led around the side of one of the buildings, leading away from the carnival. Yeah, I know, we should have called it quits right then. I felt uneasy, and could tell my friends were as well. But I guess we thought, why not completely chase him off? This would save the next girl that was alone, one that could end up his next creepy target. He turned and looked at us before he walked around the corner. They completely turned around and let us see him. We all stopped completely and stared at him. He just smiled and went around the corner. We made the decision to see what he was up to. We continued around the corner after him. Now here's the strange thing. He was gone. Nowhere in sight. We walked around that corner only a few seconds later, and this guy was completely gone, despite this area being a dead end with no doors. There were no dumpsters or anything. Just three brick walls close to 20 feet tall. Literally, physically, nowhere to go. Needless to say, we were shaken, so we called it a night. That was more than enough for us. If I had to give you advice, even if you're in a group, don't get cute and try to follow a creep. Let them leave if they walk away. As for me, I never want to run into a creep with a ponytail again. Ghosts in the Graveyard From C. Philly 100 This happened to me and some friends sometime in high school, back in the early 2000s. There is a cemetery in Denver called Fairmount Cemetery. It was founded in 1890 and is Denver's second oldest operating cemetery after Riverside Cemetery. It was designed by German landscape architect Reinhard Schutz. At 280 acres, the cemetery is patterned after the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston. This happened in 2006 or so. It was either Halloween or the Day of the Dead. I can't remember which. And my buddies John and Trevor and I decided it would be fun to go hang out in the cemetery and smoke there. Teenagers, right? So we hopped the fence and we hadn't even smoked yet, but we were already getting a weird sense, like some sort of presence was out there with us. We began to make our way through the dark and misty tombstones. We were respectful, not stepping on any of the plots, or at least we tried not to anyway. We got down to a hill that was pretty exposed, but it wasn't close to any plots, so we sat down and got ready to fire it up. Just then, we saw what looked to be a series of small blue LED lights, like on a wand or something, like the kind of wands that people use at the airport to direct planes into the terminal. We figured maybe it was a security guard with a weird flashlight or something of the sort. However, it was already trailing out of sight, so we ignored it. We got into position and got all nice and toasty. Suddenly, the night was alive with these orbs of light, bouncing all around us, the most beautiful colors of red and blue and purple and green. They were skipping across the tops of tombstones, twirling and dipping and diving. We were awestruck, and we were all seeing the same things too, so they couldn't have been hallucinations. Then, just as suddenly as they had appeared, they were gone, like all the air had been sucked out of the very night itself. And suddenly it got so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. The kind of darkness you can almost feel and touch. Heavy, thick, and sticky. 
Up ahead of us, we saw a light mist forming in the swirling wreaths of black. We couldn't quite make it out at first. Gradually, to our collective horror, we could see what could only be described as a grim reaper. Tall and skinny, a skeletal figure, shrouded in shadow, cloaked in that smoky, swirling mist. Its eyes seemed to be lit up from within, a soft red gleam glowing from within its sunken human skull for a face. It wore a black hood, and it had long, slender fingers that wrapped around a massive sickle with a huge blade. We noped the heck out of there, running as fast as we could for the fence. We could hear it chasing after us, and just as we made it to the fence, we turned around to see it flying through the air right at us. We jumped on the fence and hopped over to the other side. When we turned around, that thing flew straight upwards, soaring high into the night and eventually out of sight. I guess it simply wasn't our time. But I will say this, don't go smoking at night in graveyards, especially during Halloween or the Day of the Dead. Beware if you're in Denver, because the angel of death is still out there somewhere. Maybe he's still flying high, waiting for someone to take with him. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks Add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at EerieCast.com slash plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.